everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Dual Podcast. My name is Craig O'Donoghue from the West Australian Newspaper, taking you through another season of talking to guests from the Perth Wildcats, Perth Lynx, and WA Basketball in general to give you the best insight possible into what is happening in the sport throughout this state. And wasn't it a remarkable week for basketball in the state last week? When Cleveland Cavaliers general manager Mike Gansey landed in Perth and spoke to us on Tuesday, he was planning on spending a few days with Luke Travers and watching him play on Friday night against New Zealand. And that was going to be a box office event. But then suddenly the breakers caught COVID, couldn't travel, and Gansey went home without seeing a game, which was unfortunate for him. But he did get to spend time with Travers and provide more insight into what it will take to get from WA to the NBA. Travers is just the second West Aussie to ever get drafted to the NBA, and I'm happy to say the man chosen 25 years before him is my guest today. Ben Pepper, welcome to the Dribble Podcast. Hi, Craig. Thanks, mate. So, June 25, 1997, with pick 56, (laughs) the Boston Celtics select Ben Pepper from the Newcastle Falcons, but really from Geraldton. Take me back to that day. Well, it was. Um, I, I sort of knew something might have been happening in, in the build-up because it wasn't something that we, we had sort of um, had sort of knew was going to happen. It sounds weird now when I try and explain that, but I hadn't uh, exactly nominated for the draft. But we just knew between myself and my agent that we knew that there was a chance that um, that Boston and there was another team too, Portland actually had showed some interest as well. But Boston had said that they were um, sort of sniffing around or somewhat interested and. Uh, and sure enough, it, it happened, and it was all, um, yeah, it was all, all, all a bit um, uh, surreal, really. Like it really was. It's um, it, it was uh, a crazy time, but um, you know, just just to you know, to, to hear your name uh, called out or to know that your name was called out was um, it was uh, amazing. So pick 56, kind of ironic that Luke Travers was also pick 56. So um, we've had the two WA guys. Well, while Luke Longley was drafted in the NBA, he, he's not considered a pure West Aussie because he was born up elsewhere. So <laughs> the two pick yep. 56, both from WA. Luke watched from his temporary draft home in the US and spent the rest of the day doing media. Drafts are all razzmatazz these days. What did your day entail? Oh, wow. Um, I remember it happening. Uh, I'm trying to remember. <laughs> it is a while ago, so I'm trying to remember. I, I, I just remember being, uh, I, I think I'd, um, I I was with in Newcastle, obviously, and uh, I believe that once we found out, the next day I had a lot of media to do. Um, I remember going on the Today Show early in the morning, and I'd been out the previous night. I had a few little celebratory drinks and what have you, nothing crazy. But um, and then I had to go very, very early the next morning to do some media and stuff, and uh, it was all, um, you know, uh, just liaising with my um, uh, with my agent, and um, and uh, it, you know, it was sort of, um, it wasn't, it wasn't, you know, it was late in the second round, so it wasn't like I was talking to the team that much or doing anything like that. It was basically just talking to friends and family and um, and teammates of the time, and uh, and. Um, really just um, sort of taking it all in, I guess, soaking soaking it all in, yeah. So if we go back to that day, this is how the draft actually started. Let's go back to the number one pick. With the first pick in the 1997 NBA draft, the San Antonio Spurs select Tim Duncan from Wake Forest University. Fair number one pick. He went okay, just a lazy five championships and two NBA MVP awards. Australia's Chris Anthony also went in the first round, while Paul Rogers yep. and CJ Bruton um, went just before you. Did was there much yep. chat having four having four Aussies in that draft? Did you chat much? You know what, Craig? We really didn't. No, um, <laughs> not really. Um, no, you'd think there might have been a bit of a you know being in that in that fraternity and them all sort of moving in the same circles, but we really didn't. Um, I sort of. I, I didn't know either of those guys that well at the time. I, you know, not, so so, not really. I mean, I'd been in Newcastle, and um, it, it sort of uh, no, no. It was um, as I said, it wasn't something I knew was going to happen. And um, and then you know, in in, in in passing, when we we played against each other and things like that, we might, it might come up, but nothing, nothing too too major. I mean, I, I, being drafted was something, but it, it, it still felt like that it really wasn't. I hadn't hadn't really achieved that much as far as hadn't really played or anything like that. So it was sort of more a feather in the cap, but it wasn't something that I'd, I'd walk around sort of talking about all the time, to be honest. So um, we didn't really talk about it that much. I mean, I think maybe if we, 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 our paths crossed these days. I mean, I've seen Rogers around the traps a few times and we may have chatted about it, but um, nothing to, it wasn't something that we talked about in depth or anything. No. 
you were pretty raw, weren't you, from, from a basketball perspective at that point? You were you were picked more on what, what you Attention. might become rather than what you'd actually achieved at the time. Would that be correct? Absolutely, no, no, no. And I'm the first to admit that it was all it was all very quick. It was um it was just it, it all happened very quick. I mean, I only started playing basketball when I was about 16, 17. I mean, to be drafted at twenty one, I think I was yeah twenty one. I mean. Yeah, I, I can't even. Yeah, yeah. It was it was all very quick, and I was an NBA fan because that's what got me into the into basketball. Obviously, I was very tall, but I loved the NBA. I loved watching the NBA. I loved Michael Jordan around that time, and then obviously knowing of the Celtics and the history and all that sort of stuff. So it was all, as I said, to say surreal. Well, it doesn't doesn't really do it justice. So um, yeah, it was a very raw, very. Um, very, uh, I, I didn't have my pathway was very different to a lot of to a lot of people. Like you bring up Travis, my pathway was very very different to to, to someone like Luke's. So I can imagine um, where where mine was. Um, uh, well, I can't really. It's it's hard to explain. Mine was just sort of to start playing and 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 learn the game myself within reason. I had some help here in Geraldton from certain people, but uh, other than that, it was all very. Um, it was all sort of um, you know no state teams and things like that. So. Yeah, it was um, it was it was a crazy time, but um, you know it was. Um, but I, I just loved the game. I had a passion for the game. Loved it. Loved loved basketball, and I just couldn't get enough of it. And I think that served me well. So fr- from Geraldton to Boston must have felt like going to the moon, really. <laughs> like it was, it's, such, it's such a different world that what you grew up into, what what you were being drafted into you mentioned that you, know, you didn't go through the pathways but you, you improved so quickly like how did you improve so dramatically at, at that point in your, in your in your life well i, I just the, the passion for the game i think that's what i when i when i talk to, to young kids like i coach a, a, a young it's if you love the game you'll do you know you want to you just want to you just want to keep playing it every day if you keep doing that every day then you'll you'll get better but i, I don't know i, I just I, I guess i played a lot of other sports i was natural i had a bit of natural sporting ability nothing amazing or anything but i played cricket and golf tennis i mean believe it or not i mean uh, I, I i liked all sports but basketball when i i got to obviously a fair fair height i mean i was about six eight six nine by the time i was sort of 17 16 17 and i had a couple of friends that said why don't you why don't you to play basketball so i did and it was love it. it just i just loved it i just loved it and um i sort of i started doing that and then um uh believe it or not i i, I had to get a job around that time and my family we have car dealerships here in Geraldton. and dad was like what are we going to do i'm like oh, okay well you know maybe you can be an apprentice mechanic now i'm anyone that you anyone that knows me you know, I'm, I'm a horrible i've got no handyman skills no so it was probably the worst path i could have taken but it did it so i did try being an apprentice mechanic but around that time i just started sort of really getting into basketball playing for the the, the state team here the, the buccaneers in the sbl and um and i'd shown a little bit of talent and a little bit of you know and i thought that i could be okay but you know i wasn't i wasn't cocky but i thought you know a little bit of i'm tall enough i got a bit of you know maybe i should try so i go to my dad and say look maybe i can do away with the the apprentice mechanic stuff and I'll do that for half a day, um, or, I'll, or I'll go work in accounts, sorry, for half a day, and I'll go play basketball for half a day and try and work on my game. And believe it or not, that's what I did, and I would go and work out on my own and with certain people. There's a gentleman here, or a guy here that coached the Buccaneers at the time, Wayne Hares, who's big into the WA basketball scene in Bunbury, and he was coaching the Buccaneers here at the time, and a guy, Dan Hunt, who's a big sort of um, – he, he, he really helped me out a lot, Dan Hunt, and he still helps me out to this day. And um, he's a good man. He played. He, he he's an American guy that has based himself in Geraldton and, and helped me out a lot. And he would sort of took me under his wing. And um, and that's what I did. I, w- I would work half a day and then go play basketball for half a day, do some weights and things. And that was nothing too serious, but it was enough to to show that I was pretty keen on it and and a at a commitment and accountability and all that sort of stuff that showed. Look, I was I was keen to improve. I loved it, and I would do that to to, to get better. And um, and I did. I started getting better, and I. I played for the Buc- as I said for the Buccaneers here in the SBL and for a couple of years and, and and got better and better and had a few big games and, and got on the on the map a little bit and um, and it sort of went from there really it sort of all, all snowballed from there. So you obviously had the passion, you had the height, you're 213 centimeters, so you're massive, and you had the the, the raw <laughs> the raw ability that we saw throughout your NBL career. Did it just come too soon? getting drafted like do you reckon if you were picked up two years later or had another two years worth of, of experience under your belt that it might have been different perhaps yeah perhaps um 
I think so. Yeah, it, it was all it, it, it all came uh, in '97. It sort of all sort of happened as far as being selected. You know, with in the Boomers squads, and the, I mean, we we won a gold medal that year with the under twenty three team. Uh, then the, the whole Boston thing happened, and it it was a lot. It was a lot. Um, I think it may have, but. Um, I just think because I was a pretty laid back sort of a kid as well, it sort of all came. I, it's not like I chased it; it came to me within reason. I was just playing basketball because I loved it, and then these things came along, and then I was like, "Well, wow, this is um, this is getting out of hand." Uh, so so uh, I know that sounds stupid to think of. I know that's probably not, but that sort of was my thinking at the time. Like, wow, it's um, you know, I, I I really don't know the game yet. I need I've got a lot of learning to do. So perhaps perhaps it was a little bit early, but look. You know, it's it's one of those things that happens, and um, I probably wouldn't change it. I don't think for for, for whatever reason, but it, it is what it is at this stage. And um, but yeah, it, it happened very very quickly. Did you get to the US at any point, or did they come out here like like? Yeah, Gansy, yep. no, no, I went over there. No, no, I went over there. I went to Boston um, and hung out for a week or two. Uh, like Craig, this, uh, the the story. I mean, I can't believe sometimes I, I think that really happened. But I remember my first game. I went out there. I flew out there. I was staying in Boston. The general manager, I think it was Chris Wallace at the time. I want to say, he said, "Come, you know, we'll, we'll get you to the game. We go to the game. They they take me out onto the court at halftime and interview me, so, uh, interview me. Sorry, to the Boston crowd. Into, uh, meet all the players. I think Paul Pierce had just been drafted. Chauncey Billups. Um, they had a, they were working on a squad. Patino had just taken over, but I was in the locker room with them after. They they they, they sort of introduced me to Patino, who's in another room after the game, and he's passed out on the couch like sweating. And I go in and meet him. It was all." It was all, as I said, it was quite surreal. It was all a bit rushed, but I was there about a week and then um, sort of met them all and it was sort of really a meet and greet but um, and go from there. And I think I, after that, I ended up going to Arizona to meet up with a, a travelling Australian team. It may have been the South East Melbourne Magic after that, but anyway, my agent, I flew out there and ended up spending a bit of time with them as well in uh, in Arizona. But um, no, no, I did get over there. I, I sort of uh, went up in, into the offices and saw, saw all the stuff and uh, it was... No, again, again, it was still all surreal. So it was still around that time. It was all a bit like, wow, this is, um, you know, it was pretty crazy. And then my age at the time was actually Leon Rose, who who's gone on to do, I mean, massive things, massive, massive things. He's, I think he runs the Knicks now. He's the general manager of the Knicks. Um, he he had Chris Anstey, um, and he was sort of he was looking after me as well. So yeah, it's interesting because. Of the 29 players who were drafted in that second round, 10 were like yourself, never received an NBA contract. Five had one season, six had two seasons. So it felt like a lot of the, the latter pick, later picks were almost an afterthought once the, the draft mm. had, had happened. Luke's in the, the similar situation, pick 56, but he's got the, yep. the, the Cavs clearly coming over here and, and pursuing him um, rather than just leaving him to his own devices. What are your thoughts on, on his chances? you watch him enough? Yeah, yeah, I watch I watch him all the time. Um, I, I watch the cats all the time, and um, it's it's good to see that they're turning turning the corner. Uh, I think, but um, oh, he's a lot more polished than me. I think he's got a lot better chance than me. Um, he's he's um, his game. I mean, he, he comes in and out at, at times. He sort of can can drift a little bit, but I mean, th- those times are becoming fewer and far between. And 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 I mean, give him another year, and he, th- those times will probably disappear, and he'll become that sort of that force that he is for, for, for longer periods of time. I think that's what happens. You just become that, that, that sort of efficient player for longer periods of time. And, um, you know, I watched the, I think it was the game, the Cavs, the, the, the general manager was meant to come out and watch in that second half of that game. He really, he really turned it for the cats and, and sort of was a huge, huge impact. You saw that you saw that you saw the Travers in the first half that were made. Man, it was a bit slow for whatever reason, but the second half is just showed what he is. And, um, I think he has a great chance, and he's got a good attitude from what I can gather. And um, and um, yeah, I, 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 yeah, I think he's um, I think he's a very good chance. So, any ad- advice in general for him, like in terms of um, uh, not not b- being as impatient as you can be, or pushing through as quickly as you can, because it, it can go so quickly. Like, what what advice would you give him from a timeline perspective of, of just wanting to get there as quickly as possible? Yeah, I think it's just that advice that you give to any young player, isn't it? That you, you, you that it does go quick. <laughs> that uh, sometimes you feel like you're in the grind. I think you know, with with basketball, you can be training every day, twice a day. It can become, it can become that grind, just like any other normal job. Um, but 
you've got to understand in the moment, if you can, that it's all very short and it goes quick and to, to, to really chase it and have that, you know, every opportunity that, that arises. So, um, I mean, that's, that's all, but he'll, he'll do that, no doubt. And, um, it looks like he's already doing that from what I can gather. So, um, no, just that, that then, and I'm sure he understands that, and I'm sure he's got good people in his corner, and um, and he'll do all that. So no, I, I I don't think there's much I could sort of say other than that that does go fairly quick, and um, and um, yeah, just to um, to embrace it and to uh, to take every opportunity. Now you had one hell of a career. And Pepper gets it back, gets his way past Brooks. Ben Pepper now the only man in offense for the Titans. Going to work, hits Pepper. He finds it inside. It's a two-point game. 384 games while playing for the Newcastle Falcons, North Melbourne Giants, Victoria Titans, Victoria Giants, Wollongong Hawks, <laughs> New Zealand Breakers, and Townsville Crocodiles. You've got an entire <laughs> golf club set there. Uh, what was the highlight? Oh, wow. Um, I don't know. I, I've put a record. Some of those teams went, went bust as well. Like, we would just get told one day that, uh, oh, by the way, you, you, the team is now becoming, it's merging with so-and-so to become, you know, like it, it was quite, it was weird when you think about looking back that um, I played for, I was, I'd signed a contract with North Melbourne Giants and, and Brett Brown, you know, the, the famous Brett Brown obviously calls me the, one day and says, oh yeah, we're merging with the Magic, I'm no longer the coach, Brian Gorgian's going to be a coach, you're going to be a new team. And that was it. That's all I got, and that and that all starts to take shape the next day. So, it was it was strange. It was it was a weird time for the NBL. It was a very um, there's a lot of upheaval going on. Where it's, these days it's a bit more stable, and um, the teams are, are a bit more sort of uh, as air stable and locked in. But around that time, uh, it was it was a very um, the, the league probably wasn't as um, as stable as it is now. But um, I, I don't know the highlights. A lot of highlights. I mean, wow, the, the opportunities and the things that I had to get to play for Brian Gorgian for. For three or four years, that was amazing. And make a couple of grand finals. We never won one. The, the, the Wildcats got us in one. And that Adelaide, the, the great Adelaide teams of the late 90s with your, your Brett Mars and your, oh, gee, I could go through them all. Brett Mars, David Stiff, Reese, um, uh, Brooks. I mean, they, yeah, they, they, were, they were a tough team. But we had a good squad too, but they were tough. And then the Wildcats got us. But um, I don't know, just a whole lot, I think. Just. Um, um, just uh, the the ability to move in those those circles and play for some of those coaches and be around those guys and the teammates over the years, um, you know, it was all when you when you look back on it, it was all it was all pretty amazing. But um, I, I I think uh, it didn't around that time. I, won, I said I think I referred to that point. I won a gold medal with with the um, under twenty three uh, team. That was probably my highlight. That looking back in '97 in Melbourne to do that in front of our home crowd, you know, playing against some pretty good teams. Um, to hear hits a buzzer beater in the semis, I want to say, or even the quarters, um, to beat the great Argentinian team that had, you know, Ginobili and Alberto and some some guys that you've probably heard of that um, that had a and that Argentinian team then would go on to become the core of the teams that that win Olympic gold. So to beat that team was amazing and we beat the States that tournament. So to be a part of that was, was unbelievable. I think that that was probably my, my highlight, I think, but the NBL stuff was just the NBL stuff for the fact that you're getting to do that, um, to play basketball and to do that for a living was, um, was pretty amazing. Yeah. For, 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 for a long time. Yeah. Were you ever close to playing for the Wildcats in that big, golf bag with all the clubs that were sitting in there did you did, did, did that ever become a possibility <laughs> yeah it did i mean I, I wanted to play for i mean I, I wanted to play for the cats um you know growing up in wa i was under their nose and this is not i would never bag it i mean the cats were fine they went on to win championship and championship so but i wanted to i think i was open to that but i and i was here in gerald um but they sort of never really you know they, they i mean and i don't blame them i was raw and um, they had other guys around that time there was a few big guys that i'd sort of Thought that maybe I could work to, to, to overcome around that time, um, but um, it never really happened. And, and, and Newcastle came in with an offer fairly quick. I remember um, Tom Wiseman had called me and said that well, they're going on a tour, and this was in about 1996 or something, or 95, or maybe, and um, for the last spot on the Newcastle Falcons roster. And uh, I was a bit apprehensive about doing that. I, I think I, I ended up doing that or going away to Korea to play 
and um, and they basically wanted to sign me up there and then after about three or four days, which was, to me it was all – I hadn't played that well really, but I think they could see what maybe I could become and um, and they wanted to sign me then and there, but I was still a bit sort of, well, hang on, I'm, I'm from Gerald, no, I'm going to go back and, and talk to my family and things about that. So I ended up doing that. So, um, you know, they, they'd they sort of offered me a contract and, and, um, and Wildcats still hadn't been around at that stage. So I did that. And then there was a bit of interest from the Wildcats after the fact, but it was sort of a done, a done deal then. And then about midway through my career, I was close to doing it, but we could never get on the same page. Um, I think it was sort of when they wanted me, I wasn't ready. And when I wanted to come back, they weren't ready either. So, but the Wildcats did just fine without me. That's for sure. <laughs> they were, uh, I don't think they. I don't think they. Um, I don't think they were too upset about that. So um, it, it's fine. It's um, it's just the way it sort of turned out. Yeah, you're very loyal to the Buccaneers as well at Geraldton. Like you played for them as, as often as you could. Like it yeah. seemed like you really enjoyed having the opportunity to represent your hometown. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that's they gave me my start, and um, as I said, people like Dan Hunt. Um, I mean, my family were, were very helpful to me as well, and being from Geraldton, and, and that's that's when it, when I first started falling in love with Bath, that's who I would go and watch is the Buccaneers, and they were like, why they were up, there. they were way off in the distance, thinking there's no way I could ever do that. You know, that's. But then, you know, that because that, that was the highest you could get to in Geraldton and, and to play for, for for the state basketball team, you know, would be – that was my goal. And then to do that was was a real achievement. And um, and then, obviously, it went on from there. But, yeah, absolutely. And I played for um, – I always joke around, Craig, that I, I played for the Bucks for three years when I was skinny and I played for three years when I came back when I was fat. And <laughs> – I the Geraldton didn't get to see the in between, so um, it was it was sort of they saw me up and coming, and they saw me when I was a bit over the hump. So because um, I, I played for three years for about uh, eleven to thirteen or something when I'd retired from the NBL, and um, and uh, and I was probably had put on a few kgs, and um, yeah, they saw the uh, they yeah, as I said, yeah, so they saw me when I was skinny, saw me when I was fat. But I but regardless, I love playing for the Bucks because it was that sort of semi. Semi-professional sort of thing where you have fun and you you know you you, you can sort of um, it's a bit more uh, it's a bit more relaxed but still being serious. You're 47 now. You're still in Geraldton, as you mentioned, with a car dealership and kids and life taking you in all different different directions. What is life like for you after basketball? And if people do want to go and get a car, wish they had. <laughs> Uh, well, we, 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 we've got Young Motors. We, we, my, my dealership, or our deal, dealership, I try and run is Young Motors. It's called Young Motors on the Highway. It's a Rams, Volkswagens, um, LDV. So, but we've the, the the family has had a car dealership, another car dealership. We started that one about ten years ago, and this the other one is also Young Motors in town. That's been around nearly a hundred years. So that was like a Holden dealership, but that's no more because. But they have other 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 brands there. So. Um, yeah, it's it's what I, I I sort of came back to town. My my mother was uh, sick, and I wanted to spend a bit of time with her. I still had two years left on my contract in Townsville, so I, I walked away. I walked away from two years to sort of come back and spend a bit of time with my mother, who was very ill at the time, which I did. I'm glad I did that, and um, I got dragged into the family business, which was cars. So. I couldn't get away. Once you're in, you're you're in. So um, I'm. Uh, that's what I'm trying to do at the moment. And um, yeah, it's um, you know it's different. It's just a different lifestyle. It's a different sort of um, um, the day to day grind is a lot different than than the basketball than the basketball stuff. But it's it's it has its challenges. Both have their challenge, unique challenges. But no, enjoying it for the most part. Ah, brilliant. Well, look, thank you so much for joining us. You're an amazing story. Not many people can say they've been drafted to the NBA, and certainly not many people can do can say they've done it from Western Australia. Um, you've had you had one hell of a career in the NBL as well afterwards. So you're a really terrific WA success story. So thank you very much for coming on. Thanks, Craig. I appreciate it. Now, we record this podcast on a Tuesday morning and upload on Wednesday for you to listen to, which means everyone who's listening to this knows exactly what's happened in the Perth Wildcats game against Cairns on Tuesday night, but the game hasn't actually been played as we're recording it at the moment. So uh, that's why there's no references to that game in this podcast. Uh, We do have an update on the Wildcats postponed game against New Zealand, though. And while the club wanted that Friday night game to be moved to another marquee time slot, fans are going to have to accept the idea of it being shifted to a... Tuesday. Yep, we've had Thursday, 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 Monday, and now the next game is going to be a Tuesday, which is 
Fair to say it's not ideal. Uh, it'll be Tuesday, January 10. So at least it is during the school holidays so the kids won't have too many issues in terms of going out late and getting up the next day. It'll just be the parents who have to go to work or put up with kids who are tired. Um, the players will know they're alive, though. How's this for a schedule? December 27 in Brisbane. December 31 in Wollongong. January 4 in New Zealand. January 7 in Sydney. Then January 10 in Perth. That's five games in 15 days across five different cities and then they get the open air game on January 14 before then having a few days off ahead of the Sean Reddidge retirement jersey match which will be on January 20 so there's a fair bit going on for the Wildcats during that time. Perth Lynx, well they had a rough night up in Townsville and it's been a rough season so far. The team is 2-5 and five and looks a fair way off the pace compared to the top four teams. Bendigo and Melbourne are the clear front runners. Townsville are powerful and Southside are also extremely tough to beat. Uh, sadly for the WNBL. It's not even Christmas and it's hard to really see any other teams breaking into that top four with the way these teams are all performing at the moment. The Lynx face the University of Canberra Capitals in the nation's capital on Wednesday night. The Capitals are yet to win a game this season and that's a match Perth simply must win in their last clash before Christmas. Uh, They have to get onto the winning list for there. The NBL will hold a Christmas Day basketball game this year with Sydney facing Melbourne. It'll be really interesting to see the attendance, the viewership and the feelings of players and coaches given It's such a family day over here. America might have the love of sport on Christmas Day, but we haven't seen it yet in Australia, so it'll be really interesting to see what happens there. So that's it for this week's episode of the Dribble Podcast. Remember, you can read all of your basketball news in the West Australian newspaper and keep logging on to thewest.com.au as well. Thank you so much to Ben Pepper for his time. Thank you to the wonderful Shannon Bevan for her production work. Have a fantastic Christmas. We'll be back in the first week of January with the next episode of the Dribble Podcast. We won't be recording next week. So enjoy your Christmas. Have a good and safe time with your family. And we'll speak to you in January.